Welcome. I'd like to share with you some observations about the Bhagavad Gita. I hope these insights will help you use the profound teachings of the Gita more effectively in your own process of spiritual growth. In this presentation, we'll discuss some of the symbolism found in the Gita. Specifically, we'll discuss the symbolism associated with Kurukshetra, the battlefield where the Bhagavad Gita was taught for the first time. And we'll also discuss symbolism associated with the chariot occupied by Sri Krishna and Arjuna on that battlefield. Long ago, what is widely regarded as the greatest battle in human history took place over the course of 18 days on the fertile plains of North India in a place known as Kurukshetra, the land of the Kurus. The ancient Hindu epic, the Mahabharata, in its enormous span of 84,000 Sanskrit verses, describes that battle. It gives a detailed account of the convoluted events that led up to the war. It graphically depicts each bloody day of combat, and it examines the war's terrible aftermath. In the middle of the Mahabharata's 2,000 or so chapters, there's an 18-chapter section which forms a Bhagavad Gita. Its 700 verses express some of the most sublime spiritual teachings known to man. On the battlefield of Kurukshetra, a horrendous confrontation took place between two branches of the Kuru family, the Pandavas, who were led by the five sons of Pandu, and the Kauravas, who were led by Duryodhana, the evil-minded son of the blind king, Dhritarashtra. On the very first day of battle, shortly before fighting commenced, a conversation between Lord Krishna and the Pandava warrior Arjuna took place in the midst of that vast battlefield. It is that very conversation which is recorded in the verses of the Bhagavad Gita. Kurukshetra is not only the historical location of the war, but that battlefield also has two important symbolic meanings, which are woven into the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. First of all, the battle between the Pandavas and Kauravas symbolically represents the battle between dharma and adharma, righteousness and unrighteousness. That is, the prototypical struggle between right and wrong, between good and evil. This struggle has continued throughout human history, from the time tribes were fighting with each other with crude weapons, up to modern times when nation states are armed with thermonuclear weapons. The war fought on the fields of Kurukshetra was a Dharma Yuddha, a battle to defeat the forces of Adharma, a battle to restore righteousness to the kingdom. The Bhagavad Gita describes this battle between Dharma and Adharma in its opening lines. Dharma Kshetre Kurukshetre Samaveta Yuyutsavaha the warriors, Yuyutsavaha, were assembled, Samavetaha, where? Kurukshetra, on Kurukshetra, which was a Dharmakshetra, a field of Dharma, a battlefield on which a colossal struggle between Dharma and Adharma took place. The Pandavas were led by Yudhishthira, who was known as Dharmaputra, which means son of Dharma. His father was none other than the god of Dharma, who blessed his mother Kunti with a child. Yudhishthira was revered throughout the kingdom for his vast wisdom, his steadfast honesty, and his unwavering commitment to righteousness. Duryodhana, on the other hand, had a personality and disposition that was nearly the polar opposite of Yudhishthira's. In a famous verse from the Mahabharata, Duryodhana says, Dharmam cha janami, na cha me pravrittihi. I know what is dharma, but I can't make myself follow it. Adharmam cha janami, na cha me nivrittihi. I know what is adharma, 
but I can't restrain myself from doing it. Duryodhana readily admits that even though he knows what is right and wrong, he is unable to act in accordance with what he knows. His knowledge and behavior are at odds with each other. And this points to the second symbolic meaning of the battlefield. In addition to portraying the battle between dharma and adharma, it also portrays an internal battle, a battle that is waged in our minds and hearts, a battle between our intellects and emotions, between head and heart. Let me explain. Duryodhana understood the difference between dharma and adharma, and to understand something requires use of one's intellect. Intellect is the seat of understanding and the instrument of discernment. Duryodhana could discern dharma properly, but he was driven to actions contrary to his discernment. What drove him? His powerful emotions. Emotions like anger, frustration, hate, and envy. Due to such emotions, Duryodhana acted in ways contrary to his intellectual discernment about dharma. In this way, his intellect and emotions were in conflict with each other. Of course, not only Duryodhana is subject to this conflict between head and heart, everyone is susceptible. This conflict can be seen whenever we utter the words just this once. Like when your favorite sweet is served and you choose to temporarily disregard your strict diet. With these three little words, just this once, we acknowledge the fact that whatever we're about to do is wrong and then we give ourselves permission to do it anyway with the lame excuse that we won't do it again. Intellectually, we know better. Emotionally, we just give in. When we say just this once, doesn't our attitude begin to resemble that of Duryodhana? To better understand this inner battle or conflict between intellect and emotion, it'll help if we shift our attention to the symbolism associated with the chariot occupied by Krishna and Arjuna. The chariot metaphor, or Ratha Drishtanta, has its origin in the famous Katha Upanishad and is found in other scriptures, including the Bhagavad Gita. We'll use an adapted version here. In this metaphor, the chariot represents your physical body. The chariot's wheels represent your arms and legs. The powerful horses that draw the chariot down the road represent your powerful emotions, like desire, that draw you towards the people, things, and activities that you love. The road represents your path through life. Forks in the road represent the decisions you make. The charioteer, who guides the chariot, represents your intellect, which chooses the paths you take in life. And finally, the owner of the chariot, the Rata Swami, simply sits in the back of the chariot, enjoying the ride. He represents Atma, your true self, which we'll discuss at length in other presentations. Now, suppose the chariot is traveling down a road and the thirsty horses see a pond of water on the side of the road. The horses will begin to pull the chariot off the road and towards the pond, but they're oblivious to a deep ravine that lies between the road and a pond. A terrible catastrophe is certain unless the charioteer remains vigilant and pulls back on the reins to keep the horses on the road. This demonstrates what happens when our emotions start pulling us towards something that could be harmful, like when a married person is attracted to someone other than their spouse. Our intellects must rein us in, so to speak, and hold us back when our emotions pull us towards a dharma. A crucial role of our intellects is to keep us on the path of dharma, 
and to prevent us from being dragged by our emotions down a path of adharma. But it doesn't always work out that way. Suppose the charioteer is inattentive, or suppose he's not very skillful, or suppose the horses pull with so much force that he's unable to control them. Then disaster will certainly ensue. In the same way, if we are inattentive or careless or distracted, we're likely to make mistakes. If we lack the skill to properly discern dharma and adharma, we'll make mistakes. And if we're too weak to prevent our emotions from dragging us down the path of adharma, then we'll make even more mistakes. And as you know, our mistakes can have terrible consequences. Our emotions can land us in hot water, so to speak. On the other hand, emotions are not our enemies. Emotions make us human, caring, tender, and loving. Without emotions, we'd be like machines or robots. Emotions are natural, and they're not the problem anyway, as we'll see shortly. When the horses begin to pull the chariot off the road and towards the pond and deep ravine, they're not bad horses. They're normal, thirsty horses. In the same way, when we feel attracted to something adharmic, something sinful or harmful, we're not bad people. We're normal people with normal desires. There's no problem for the charioteer as long as he diligently performs his job. And there's no problem for us either, as long as our intellects remain attentive, judicious, and strong, and they consistently guide us down the path of dharma. Regarding emotions, we have to consider the fact that like the charioteer's horses must be cared for, our emotions must also be cared for. Part of the charioteer's job is to care for his horses. A skillful charioteer can tell when his horses are thirsty, and he'll lead them safely to water. A skillful charioteer knows when his horses are tired and need rest. This implies that our intellects must be constantly engaged in caring for our own emotional welfare. The responsibility for your emotional well-being doesn't lie with your spouse or your parents, your children, or anyone else. You are responsible. You're also responsible for the health and well-being of your body. This responsibility doesn't belong to your doctor. With this in mind, our intellects must choose our deeds wisely for the sake of maintaining our emotional and physical health. The need to care for ourselves may seem obvious, but there are times in life when we actually choose to do things harmful to our emotional and physical health. For example, when you drive yourself so hard that you fail to get enough sleep, or when you eat too much junk food for the sake of emotional comfort. These unhealthy behaviors reveal the failure of our intellects to be properly engaged in caring for ourselves. Consider a foolish charioteer who lacks the necessary skills for the job. When his horses start to pull his chariot off the road, he might use a sturdy whip to lash his horses again and again, constantly driving them on and never letting them stop to rest or drink water. What will happen? Eventually, the horses will get dispirited, sick, or injured. They could even die. That describes how we sometimes misuse our intellects in ways that ignore our own emotional and physical well-being. The fact that sleep deprivation and obesity have reached epidemic proportions in modern times demonstrates this problem quite clearly. 
We also sometimes do things that cause emotional harm to ourselves. To see how this happens, imagine yourself at a party, seeing a close friend somehow stumble and fall against a buffet table. She falls to the floor and a bowl of punch spills on her. She lies on the floor, soaked with punch, and everyone stares at her with a look of shock. What would you do, seeing your friend in that predicament? You'd go and help her, and you'd try to relieve her embarrassment. You might tell her, don't worry about it, it's nothing, forget it. Now, suppose it was you who stumbled and fell against a buffet table. As you lay on the floor, soaked with punch, with all your friends looking on, what would you tell yourself silently in your mind? Chances are that you'd scold yourself with really harsh language for your clumsiness. What a fool I am! How could I do something so stupid? It's ironic. When a friend makes a mistake, we're likely to be comforting and encouraging. But when we make a mistake, we might severely criticize and belittle ourselves. This is self-deprecation, and it can be emotionally harmful. Each criticism or harsh word towards ourselves is like another lash from the charioteer's whip. If such self-deprecation becomes habitual, it can actually damage your self-esteem. And low self-esteem frequently leads to depression. And someone who is deeply depressed might not be able to get out of bed in the morning. That's like what happens to the horses who have been mercilessly whipped and denied water and rest. They eventually give up trying to pull the chariot forward. This is a vivid example of what can happen when our intellects and emotions are in conflict with each other. The last example of this conflict we'll consider here brings us back to our earlier discussion about telling ourselves just this once, which we sometimes say to justify doing something that we know is wrong with the lame excuse that we won't do it again. This is called rationalization. We use our intellects to make a wrong action seem rational or reasonable when it truly isn't. Our intellects are meant to resist the irrational pull of our emotions, but sometimes we use our intellects to make excuses for the unreasonable demands of our emotions. It's as if our intellects somehow get hijacked by our emotions. Imagine a charioteer allowing his horses to pull his chariot off the road and towards that deep ravine, and instead of pulling back on the reins, he sanctions them with the excuse, just this once. Ridiculous. After these remarks, you'll probably think twice before using this just this once excuse again. To summarize all this, we can't afford to allow our emotions to drag us down the path of adharma, nor can we afford to ignore our normal, legitimate emotional needs. Since our emotions can't discern the difference between dharma and adharma, important decisions in life must be guided with our intellects, our heads, not by our hearts. But at the same time, we can't ignore our hearts. In fact, each decision we make must help assure our own emotional well-being. A healthy, balanced approach to decision-making is one that acknowledges the importance of both head and heart. But in spite of all this, you've probably heard a popular saying that encourages you to follow your heart. This dictum seems very appealing, but based on our discussion so far, it's crucially flawed. To follow your heart is to be guided only by your emotions, not by your intellect. 
Imagine a charioteer who allows his horses to go wherever they want. <laughs> it's easy to see the drawbacks of this follow-your-heart philosophy. But even then, someone might argue like this. Our emotions don't always drag us down the path of a dharma. They can also draw us towards dharma. This argument is certainly true, but there's still a major defect in this follow-your-heart philosophy. If the charioteer allows his horses to go wherever they want, how will he ever reach his chosen destination? When the chariot arrives at a fork in the road, will the horses take the fork leading to his destination, or will they take the other fork? The answer to this question, according to mathematics, is that there's a 50-50 chance that the horses will go the right way. That suggests that there's a 50-50 chance of your emotions drawing you towards dharma. But life is much more complicated than this illustration suggests. The tremendous complexity of decisions we have to make is better represented by a complicated intersection like this one. Now, what is the likelihood that the horses will find their way to the desired destination. It's quite clear that the charioteer had better hold on to the reins and guide his chariot correctly. In the same way, our intellects had better restrain our emotions as necessary to skillfully guide us down the path of dharma. The charioteer we've been talking about became skillful in his job because he was properly trained. He was taught how to control and care for his horses, how to use the reins effectively, and how to maintain his chariot. Usually, a charioteer would learn all this from his own father. Like the charioteer, our intellects must be properly trained. They must be taught how to discern dharma, and how to deal with powerful emotions, and how to maintain our physical and emotional health. Like the charioteer, we learn much of this from our parents. But due to the complexity of the decisions we face in life, we probably need more instruction than we received from our parents. We need the equivalent of graduate school. And that advanced instruction can be found in the Bhagavad Gita. Sri Krishna, as Arjuna's charioteer, didn't merely steer their chariot, he also guided Arjuna spiritually with the profound teachings we find in the Gita. Those same teachings can serve to guide us all in dealing with the complexity of life, in learning how to manage our emotions, and in staying focused on spiritual growth. In the beginning of chapter 2, Arjuna admits his need for guidance and asks Sri Krishna to teach him. In verse 7, he says, Karpanyato shopahatasvabhavaha prachamitvam dharma sammudha chetaha yachreyasyat nishchitam bruhitanme Arjuna admits that his swabhava, his nature, is overcome by weakness, karpanya, and that he is completely confused, samudha, about dharma. Then he says to Sri Krishna, Prachamitvam, I ask you, yat shreyaha syat. What is best? Nishchitam bruhi. Tell me clearly. Shishyaha te aham. I am your student. Shadhi mam. Teach me. Tvam prapannam. I, the one who have sought your refuge. Just as Arjuna sought out Sri Krishna's advice, we can do likewise. 
And just like Arjuna was blessed by Sri Krishna's teachings, we can all receive those blessings by studying and imbibing the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kashchadukha Bhagbaveta Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityor Ma Amritangamaya Om Shanti 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 Thank you.